This is the Do Better Podcast with Dr. Megan Miller and Joe Smith. Welcome to the Do Better Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to talk about active engagement. This is where we blast off to the final frontier in search of improving ourselves in the field of behavior analysis. Thank you for spending time with us. Now, let us begin. All right. How is everyone doing? Megan, how are you doing? It's... (laughs) <laughs> oh man, it's been some wild times lately. I um I was so excited. I finally, you know, went and took like a few weeks off and like had some vacation time. And I got back and everything went smoothly for the first week. I but it was that, you know, when you're out of the office for a while and you have to like catch up yeah. on things. So I was just like catching up, catching up. And I finally I felt like I was doing pretty good. And then Saturday, whatever, June 28th or whatever, I like had some weird stomach thing and I was like in so much pain and I was in bed all day. Sunday, I was okay. And then Monday, we've had all these like storms coming through and I've had this like sinus migraine craziness happening for since Monday and it's now Saturday, July 3rd. So I'd spend, I basically spent a lot of time in bed sleeping because I was in so much pain and then I would get like nauseous and all that kind of stuff. So I've not been doing well, (laughs) but I keep (laughs) doing this like fake it till you make it thing. And I'm like, when am I going to make it? Am I going to make it at some point? Um, finally today's the first day I woke up without a migraine, but the storms are about to come through in another like 20 minutes probably. So we'll see what happens there. And I'm still like really, really tired. Taylor woke me up at like 1am on Thursday and like wanted to sleep with me because he had a bad dream. And then he got taken out of camp early yesterday because he now has like a cough and stuff. So we had to get him tested for COVID yesterday, which I, it should be negative. I think he's just having the similar issues that I'm having with like the sinus allergy situation here. Apparently this happens every year around this time, (laughs) according to my Facebook memories. So I need to start planning travel maybe where I'm gone from like mid June to mid July and just like not in Florida. <laughs> Let me see if I can avoid it. <laughs> but um, what? So disclaimer for everyone listening or watching live. Um, I the topic that we picked to talk about today is one of my favorites, but I didn't have a chance to like read up and refresh my memory. So I'm like cheating with links open that will all get put in the show notes, but I'll be doing a lot more like reading off and like quoting things than I typically do because I just didn't really get to prep like I want to do, but we still wanted to record because it's been a while. So what about you, Joe? Hopefully so much better than me. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, like, I I wouldn't say, I mean, like, yeah, it's going well, like this, this uh, summer's here. Um, I am going fishing, you know, quite regular, regularly, which is great. I just visited Florida for a wedding, which was awesome. So first of all, I survived Frontier. Um, <laughs> I had no hiccups. Frontier was great as an airline. I didn't have any problems. It was a direct flight to Orlando, which was fantastic. We had never been on a direct flight in our lives. I love direct uh, flights. So yeah, cool. like that, that was amazing. Now, it's like one of those airlines where, yeah, it's cheap, but then you have to buy everything, which I'm Mm -hmm. perfectly fine with, you know? I I like being able to pick and choose what I want. Um, But one thing I did spoil spoil myself on is like buying seats. Like I like to buy my seats and know exactly where I'm gonna sit. And at least I get a window seat because I like looking outside the window because I'm a weirdo and I like, seeing that plane take off and feel that force. So, um, that's me, but yeah, it's going well. Um, it's been going, having a lot, um, interactions with my clients, which are great. Um, yeah. And (laughs) foster care stuff should be coming up soon. Like work into that, that closing mark where they should tell us like, yes, you're accepted or no, we don't think you're capable of handling kids well (laughs) let's hope that uh you know it's the first one (laughs) yeah I'm hoping it's the first one too like I like I like I I really do I mean you know 
stranger things have happened. So um, we shall see. We shall well, see. We will be sending positive vibes your way on that. So um, Renee joined us. Hi, Renee. So we have a few people watching on Facebook Live since we're recording this live. Feel free to um, chime in with whatever thoughts you have about our topic for today. Um, so today we wanted to talk about Joe, 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 Joe. Oh, hey, Joe. Megan. Hey. Um, <laughs> we wanted to talk about, um, how to gain the attention of others rather than saying their name and like more broadly active engagement. So Joe, when he, um, when I messaged him earlier this week in my high hopes that I would be feeling hundred percent better by the weekend, <laughs> um, and said, Hey, we need to record. It's been a while. Uh, he brought up this topic and he used the phrase active engagement, which has a whole lot of meaning for me that we'll probably get into. However, there's like a, a um, I don't know if you want to tell like the story or whatever about it, Joe, but there's a particular reason for him that it's come up. And so we're going to kind of do like we typically do and just sort of yeah. go all over the place. But do you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about um, the initial reason why you wanted to bring up this topic? So the reason why I wanted to bring up this topic is because um, one of the things I have noticed in the clinic is how often I say names of my clients, um, how often um, I have seen other uh, RBT say uh, the client names. And I just think that there's a better way of interacting with our clients. Um, and that, and like, for me, it's been a bad habit just because like being a teacher for 12 years, you kind of get away. I mean, you can't kind of get away from the idea of like active engagement and just calling your student's name, because usually as a teacher, you call a student's name, they give you a response and you continue that uh, exchange. Um, it's completely different when you're in a clinic setting. Um, even in home, it's different because like you're already actively engaged because it's one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so it's definitely been like, it's a growth period, like growth period for me, just when I'm in that type of setting to find out, I mean, to also model how to engage with our clients better. Perfect. So what I'm, um, hearing you say is it seems like what you've been relying on for engaging clients is sort of just being able to say their name and that's like the start of your interaction. Yeah, okay. yes. So you're yeah. hoping to talk about like things to do other than just saying their name. Yes, like that. that's one of the things that I wanna learn more and also to uh, model to my, um, my colleagues um, and my RBTs, like how to interact and get have active engagement with our clients. Um, so then we can just do better. <laughs> Hashtag do better. <laughs> I love it. So there's a few different ways we could go with this. We, um, I know we usually fly by the seat of our pants with this podcast anyway, but we're like really less prepared today yeah. than like ever. <laughs> um, do you want to first talk about like what is active engagement and, um, and go down that route. Or before we started, we were talking about like how you were looking in Java and trying to find some information relating to this topic. And I had some snarky things to say, which one do you <laughs> want to start with? Let's start about, let's start with, um, identifying what active engagement is, okay. because I think that's a, that's a, big point of why we're here and some people might not know what actually active engagement is. Okay, perfect. So first, I'm just curious, like when you think about active engagement, like what do you think of? When I think of active engagement, I am thinking that when you are trying to gain the attention of your client or another person, you are interacting with them in a way that is in close proximity, that is at their eye level, and 
that you are interacting with them in a way that's more um, engaged. Okay, perfect. Um, so for for me, I think of like similar things. <laughs> it's starting to rain, but I have my coffee. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Um, they, they got it just in time. Uh, so um, a lot of the work that we're doing at Florida, well, not me, because I'm not part of these studies, but I'm familiar with it because of being affiliated with Florida State is around active engagement. And so I'm going to talk about from Autism Navigator. These are, there's um, eight different things that they have listed. And this link I'll put in the chat right now and i'll put it in the the show notes uh when they look at active engagement this is what they're talking about so one is that the learner is well regulated so your child feels generally content and their needs are met um, when fussy they get over it easily two is that they're productive your child is doing something productive and an everyday activity or in play and in, and can include people in those experiences and three, they're socially connected. Your child notices you by turning or looking towards you, pays attention to what you're doing together and keeps the interaction going. These first three, they call step one coming together. So when they're training parents on active engagement, they focus on these three things first. If these three things aren't happening, this needs to be prioritized. And what's really, inter I'll talk about the other other five in a second. But what's really interesting to me is that like well-regulated is the first one. And often, at least in my experience, and um, feel free to chime in on the chat for anyone who's watching, that's one of the ones that's like the least attended to in the work that we do. And it's often actually the opposite where it's like, yeah, it's gonna get better before it gets worse. It's okay, we can power through it kind of stuff where like our clients are put through these like stressful situations. And it's like, they just need to learn how to you know, that we're here and we're going to follow through and this stuff's going to happen. But in reality, and in what the research shows, which I'll have studies in the, um, the show notes as well, that's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> our job to be the ones helping the child learn to be regulated and like work on that as a number one priority first to get that active engagement. And then once that's situated, we can move on to other learning opportunities. We seem to do it the opposite way where it's like, here's all these learning opportunities. We have our discrete trials we need to get through and all this stuff we wanna throw in the kid's face. And, it, and there's like no attention to like, is this child actually here and ready for learning? Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> so did you have anything, any thoughts on those three before I talk about the other ones? why does it why did it take us this long to get to this idea that you know or this idea that we had to um do the the basic step first before we worry about the rest of the stuff like i i like i would think that would be um thought of first like i i just feel like instead of like the idea of like let's just power through everything and you know get to where we need to go like I, I don't understand like why or where we decided that, that that's the best method. Yeah, well, and what's funny is, that, and this goes partially into the snarkiness that I had about like the Java search, but it, I mean, it hasn't taken the autism, like the people who research autism that are multidisciplinary, They've been studying this since at least 2007, so 14 years at least from the, mm -hmm. the articles that I have pulled up. So people who are really connecting and trying to understand autism and not just like approaching things from like a purely behavior analytic standpoint have recognized the importance of this for a really long time. But I should also say in the classroom outside of autism, like I know I talk about autism because that's my thing, but even if you just do a Google search on active engagement, broadly, autism doesn't even come up. It's all classroom education related things. Um, so this is a topic within education, more broadly speaking, that has been discussed, I'm sure since at least the 60s, like that's part, the big part of direct instruction, right? It was like, how do we increase the, num well, 
uh, flip it, like the research showed active engagement was like the number one predictor for best outcomes of learning, right? So then with direct yeah. instruction, that's like the big focus is how, you know, how do we increase the amount of active engagement occurring within the classroom? Because especially when direct instruction was first being developed back in the 60s and 70s, learning was so passive, right? You just sat and like the, you know, very strict structure, and right? Was, and the teachers at the front of the room. Lectures. Right. There's <laughs> lectures. But, and I can tell you like the big emphasis, even like while I was a teacher, is like, how are you interacting with your kids to get them like as much as hands-on activities? Right. Like for us, that's our focus. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the learning labs that are based on direct instruction and especially precision teaching as well, that like make so much progress with their students in such a fast period of time, they're, they're really upping the frequency of active engagement opportunities. So, you know, just broadly speaking, that's known to be a, a big deal. So to then to me, it, it even like goes further into what you were saying, like why knowing that that's in the sixties and the seventies, yeah. broadly speaking, education wise, we know the importance of active engagement, right? It's 2021 and yeah, do a job, a search on active engagement. You're not going to find much, like it's not going to yeah. be there. Um, and, um, and look at your, your broadly speaking, like most of the services being provided, ask them like, well, how are you measuring active engagement? What data are you collecting? How are you training your staff to make sure before they um, present any type of learning opportunity that the learner is actively engaged first? Like that's one of the number one things I have to do training on when I'm working with different, like whether it's mentoring or supervising or problem solving or whatever, people are presenting lear learning opportunities and the child's like <laughs> not even there <laughs> at all. Um, or they've done what's even worse and they've taught um, fake active engagement. So they focused on topography, which is interesting because we're so, we think function so important and we know function so important. It's not just, we think it, we know it, but when it comes to table time and like learner readiness, it's all based on topography. Are they sitting, facing the materials? Do they have their hands back like this? Do they look maybe at you or, you know, whatever. And it's all Is based on, straight? yeah, it's all top, top, yeah. topographical and it's yeah. not function based. So like these things that I'm talking about in this list of eight skills, none of that is being attended to, right? Like none of those things yeah. are being looked at or measured. And so you could have a child who's like sitting and doing those things, but like eyes glazed over, not even close to being connected with you. And people are trying to present learning opportunities in that setting. Now I'm not saying like those skills, like that topography isn't important necessarily, but sometimes like there's an over-focus on that. And I've had kids who are looking around and like tapping their hands and like doing all sorts of stuff that actually help keep them regulated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're more actively engaged than the kid who's just like a zombie sitting there, you know, because someone's like trained it into them that that's how they have to sit. And they're, but they're paying zero attention to what's going on around them. Which is interesting because also at schools, that's what teachers think that the students should be doing having the posture, sitting still, facing the front, when actually they're not actively engaged at all. Yeah. Instead, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. And I can tell you just even as an adult, like I engage better when I'm multitasking, <laughs> like I just do. So I've, and I've had numerous times where I'll um, be in a, a class, well, not now, because I don't take classes, but when I was getting my PhD or just in general, like going to a training or something. And it's clear, like, I don't make it a secret. I'm sitting there typing away, like doing stuff. And the person leading the instruction will try to call me out and like, ask me a question. Cause they think I'm not paying attention. And I answer. And then they're like, Oh, <laughs> oh she was actually paying attention. <laughs> so I mean, that's a whole that's like the, separate thing, but <laughs> that's like at conferences too, especially like a like conference where you're sitting in a in a lecture for like an hour like it's really tough for me to be active like actively learning like during that time if it's just a you're a lecture yeah 
Yep. And Which is and I, why those active engaging responses are so important. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So back to this list real quick. Um, with the the three here, see, Joe was like, I don't, this is going to be a fast podcast episode. It's not going to take very long. <laughs> so we talked about the well-regulated, the productive, your child is doing something productive, I think is also um, important. So I'm still on these first three. The productive one, again, a lot of the times in learning, it's so passive. We're doing things to people. We're not actively involving them in the learning, right? So like even just having learners help set out the materials or trying to make things more routine based and infuse your instruction within like the natural classroom routine or daily routine, that kind of thing, and making them part of it instead of like doing things around them or to them, having them be an active participant, I think is also missed a lot of the times as well. It, uh, especially when watching like discrete trial sessions where let's say, and I know this is what I've done and I'm not saying like I didn't have kids master, acquire, uh, check off the box, different targets, but you know, your typical dis discrete trial setup is like the cards get put out and you just ask a random question, find, you know, which one has a tail, where's the dog, which one barks, you know, and there's no context given. You're not like, Hey bud, we're going to talk about animals and like things that they do, or like, there's no, nothing given to the child there. And there's no active engagement at all, like to set up that you're going to start asking them questions. You just like throw the materials out and just start asking questions. And there's just this like assumption that they're going to start responding and realize they have to pay attention to you. Yeah. Which is interesting, like that there's like, like, like to me, like that's like for us as teachers, like we, we do also have this thing where we um, kind of prime our students for learning by asking them like questions about um, certain things or we act like start engaging in conversation about um, something they might talk about during the day, like we prod them like for that learning. And then, um, and we do get evaluated on that. Like that's like something that is expected that we do before we go into our discussion for the day or our actual like main meat and bones of the instruction. Yep. So yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think, I don't know where it comes from. Like if it's because of the original research in the field, you know, and, and when you're doing research, things get very like, um, just artificial. And, you know, I, I've been, I've had experiences where I've had families told like, you can't have, you know, you need to have a bare room with just a table and chairs and that's it, you know, no, nothing on the walls and all that. But that's like when you're looking at setting up a research lab or something, right? Like we're not, that's not what we're doing here. Um, now that doesn't mean, you know, in a classroom or a home, if a learner truly is distracted by things that like adjustments shouldn't be made. I'm not saying that, but <clears throat> the idea that it should be so artificial and so like short and no discussion, you know, at all is, is also like taking it to the extreme. It should obviously yeah. be individualized based on what a learner needs. But even if you have a learner where you're, you're trying to keep the amount of language, like number of words said at one time for comprehension purposes short, you can still start with, Hey, we're going to talk about features and what things have, you know, like you can explain what you're doing, or if you're yeah. doing, if you're trying to do some sort of like mixed VB, you could still say like, Hey, I'm going to ask you some questions now about these pictures. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's just, I don't understand why we yeah. just start like, you know, throwing crap out there and yeah. wonder why the child's not paying attention. Um, or there, again, there's just like no attempts made to get any type of active engagement, whether it's like the priming with the learning or like pairing and just doing some like funny stuff, like, um, you know, fist bumps or different, you know, like hand, like try to catch my hands or, you know, things like that. Fist bumps are my jam. Okay. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times like, Hey, yeah. Give me a fist bump. <laughs> hey, blah, 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 blah. like I, I, like I tried to pull in anything that they learned from Disney um anything that star wars related just like to make it fun engaging um i do a lot of fist bumps or head high fives have you heard of uh, head high fives? i have not heard of head high fives all right i'll put my hand up and the and they just you know hit their head <laughs> my palm, and then um and they rub their head in it and it, it's 
it's like unique for me because like that's like our th like our thing and yeah. they love it yep because it also also gives them like some pressure really too like on their forehead too yeah i love it that's awesome and then the third one for um that i went through is that socially connected that's another one again these are the first three like these are the first three for having active engagement. And again, I, it's rare that I see any one of these addressed in especially early programming classrooms, work environments, like really any, <laughs> anywhere. Um, but the socially connected piece, the child notices you by turning or looking towards you, pays attention to what you're doing together and keeps the interaction going. I've seen so many programs where the child is completely oblivious to the fact that the adult exists could care less that the adults there if they are aware of the adult it's usually to try to get away from them it's not to have a social connection um and this is nothing like it's not the child's fault at all it's obviously like the the adult needing to spend more time building that trusted connecting relationship instead of trying to come in and just start presenting a bunch of demands to the learner um so again this is another one that i think it's usually pushed aside um, and, and often made fun of like the different interventions that focus on social connection, like relationship development intervention or floor time and those types of things. Yes, they don't have the research behind them, but that doesn't mean that the focus that like relationship focus is, is something we shouldn't be looking at. And all of the research like from developmental psychology and looking at development, when you look at broader, even like into adulthood, any like social psychology, anything you look at around learning, the one of the biggest predictors again is that like social connectedness, that trusting relationship. So why that's something that's just kind of set aside as like you know I know people talk about pairing and they might do that um, and have their moments in the session where they're trying to have fun, but it's usually done. I don't want to say like coercively, but it's done in like a way where it's like, well, I have to get this part in to make it more likely that you'll you'll follow me and you'll do what I say, as opposed to making like a more genuine and authentic like this is a relationship I'm cultivating. We are going to have fun together. I trust like I want you to trust me. I care about you like we're doing this together. And like we're gonna play and have fun and that's part of just our experience together it's not playing and having fun so i can then bombard you with like five million demands <laughs> exactly um we have a comment from renee she said at our center we recommend pre-session pairing with new learners for at least 15 minutes for of each session for established clients and if a client is having a rough day, we may just do pairing and play skills, which I love. Yes. Yeah. And that's um, and that's awesome because again, a lot of places wouldn't necessarily have even that, you know, type of recommendation in place. So it's mm -hmm. a good like start, but going into like what I was talking about before, making sure that it's really coming from like a, a genuine and authentic place. It's really difficult. What that's especially when I would get people who had come from more like intensive centers where they were just like trained to like drill, drill, drill. It's hard to get people to shift in teachers to parents. Like we all have this like long checklist of things that we're trying to get through in the mm -hmm. day. And it's really hard to get people to shift away and like be flexible and, and realize like the best learning is going to happen when you just take the time to like connect with the person, whether it's an adult or a child, it doesn't matter. But when you come in genuinely and authentically with no, no other agenda on your mind besides learning that person and connecting with them, and then the other stuff can like come in from there. And that's one of one of my big issues for schools. Yes, they do care about building that relationship, but they also come in every day having agenda and holding teachers accountable for getting through that agenda like for virginia we have the sols um standards of learning and our teachers are taught to teach to those standards and you have to get through all those standards each year yeah. and some years it's just not possible because like and this is my thing too is like if you have a learner that's not ready for multiplication then 
we can't teach you multiplication, even though <laughs> if you're on that great luck, like, I'm sorry, yeah. we just can't. Yep. And what we really should focus on is what can I do to support you and get you to where you need to go? And what skill deficits do we need to teach you first to get there? And yep. that's what's not going on enough. Yeah. And that's one of my biggest issues at school. And that I think is like highlights the important or just a big shift that needs to happen both in schools and in like the, the one-on-one -on -one interventions we provide. There's such yeah. a, there's such a focus on the contents and like the, what yeah. you're getting through and, and not a focus on, again, that relationship, that connectedness, like yeah. how are you supporting this person? Like, what are you doing to help them navigate their environment, to give them like lifelong skills, like the content? ultimately doesn't matter if people have yeah. the skills to learn <laughs> to like <laughs> um, control their emotions and like get along with people right like there's these broader yeah. repertoires that like if we were measuring whether it's our rbts bcbas teachers parents whatever on like how well they can help develop good humans <laughs> yeah. right? like content aside that if that was our focus like again all of the other stuff wouldn't even matter because it would come right mm -hmm. And obviously there would need to be, it's helpful. I mean, whether again, it's behavior analysis in like a um, clinic setting or a home, or you're looking at, you know, a 12th grade classroom, knowing the content, like having people on the same page about like, these are the, the ideas of the, um, you know, for this psych 101 class, what our learning objectives are like, yes, all of that stuff should exist, yes. but what we're measuring and looking at, like, are we being successful here? It shouldn't be around that. Yeah. And I would say it would be, in, it would almost have to be individualized for each student too. Yeah. Because not every student is going to have the same um, capabilities or capacity for where the standards are set for that class. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but I, that's just how I feel. Yeah. All right, so we'll finally move on to the, the next set of three. <laughs> so step two, an active engagement they call keeping together. So the fourth thing is looking at your face often. Your child looks towards you both when asking you to do something and sharing enjoyment and interest. Step five is responding to your voice and words. Your child may not yet understand exactly what is being said, but understands that you have asked for their attention or for them to do something. And step six is communicating directly to you. Your child uses gestures, sounds, or words to send a message without being asked. Um, something big jumps out at me here, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about those three that I just shared. All right, say them again slowly for so me. Because step like four, a yeah, step four is looking at your face often. Step five is responding to your voice and words. And step six is communicating directly to you. And that could be using gestures, sounds, or words. So, and repeat that question again. I was just curious if any, if there's anything that jumps out to you when like thinking about, so this is like the first three steps of active engagement are well-regulated, productive, socially connected. So you, mm -hmm. you focus, that's your priority. Like you get those yeah. things down first. And then once you've got that, you can move on to the next three, which are looking at your face often, responding to your voice and words, and then communicating directly to you. Um, the thing that stands out to me with that second set is that those are the, like for me, those are, those are what I expect when I'm finally going to have a communication or some type of active engagement with their child. Um, with um, anything that we're talking about or learning. Perfect. Well, that and that's good that those are those are things that you're attending to and looking at. What jumps out for me is step six, communicating directly to you. Your child uses gestures, sounds or words to send a message. That's pretty much where most programs start, right? Yes. Man training, yeah? 
So yeah. all of those yeah. like five things before that and like looking at the importance of those yeah. are just like not there. Boom, we just need to get this communication happening. And it may, I mean, everyone values communication so much, but if we're over focused on that part, like the child bringing, you know, a message to us with whether it's gestures, sounds, words, pictures, whatever, and we haven't attended to those five before it, and those things are missing, the number six isn't going to happen very well, you know? No, um, it's not. And this is in the active engagement side. This doesn't even look at like some of the stuff I've talked about before with um, Brack. Uh, we had Baker, um, Braxton Baker did a presentation for us last summer around this time actually on pre um, symbolic language and like pre-communicative skills. And so like, that's a whole separate topic, but like just active engagement alone, it comes up in like multiple areas. Um, like the disservice we're doing basically with our clients, if we're over-focused on just that communication piece and we haven't attended to those five things ahead, especially that well-regulated, I can't tell you the number yeah. of times I've trying to see people, I've seen people trying to help want a learner to communicate and they're like, they're not regulated at all. <laughs> they're so yeah. stressed and they're like, um, you know, withholding items, trying to get the kid to ask for them. And the kid is so like in like tantruming and running away and like in such a heightened state of arousal because they're so over-focused on just that item and they don't have the communication skills yet. And the idea is, well, they'll communicate if we like upset them enough. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> that's like, not how this that's, works. <laughs> and it's also funny is because even like in our uh, behavior management, like um, when like QBS, with safety care, like we want our learners to be at baseline. Um, and if they're not baseline, then you have to use those um, strategies, get them back to baseline, like help wait or um, prompt to get them back to baseline. Yes. So yeah. why are we trying to teach them when they're already super upset at us and running around and, you know, cursing at us or throwing stuff at us? like? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> so that's one of the, that was one of the big things that jumped out at me. Um, and, uh, the looking at your face often, um, this one is one where it's, uh, I think like when people hear that, they, they kind of picture some of the old school, like, look at me programs where you're just like sitting in front of the kid and you're like, look at me, look at me. And people would use like physical prompts and stuff it's not like that. It's, it's more, it's naturalistic. You know, like if I'm tickling and pause, are you going to look to me like, Hey, why'd you stop? You know, kind of thing. Or just like, yeah. if I'm, if you watch like infants, they, they track people all around the environment. Um, so that's the kind of thing. And obviously you have to put in when that's not happening, a lot of work has to be done by the adults in the environment to like basically be, you know, to spotlight themselves, to make, whether yeah. it's to be a clown or, you know, like be the thing of interest to the learner to like capture their attention away from like just objects and things like that. But again, if you have learners that like you're doing fun stuff and like you're following their lead and their motivation and like you're, you're like should be the best toy they could possibly want <laughs> the best object in the room and they're not shifting gaze and like looking for you or like you do something unexpected and they're not like glancing to see what's going on why would you try to teach? Why would you think that they're ready for learning? <laughs> Cause like, they're <laughs> clearly not going to be attending to the instructions you're presenting. Right. Like, but exactly. it happens all the time. We have so many learners again, and this is like autism, but like in general ed classes too, like anywhere mm -hmm. work environments, again, like there's so many times where like people clearly are checked out. <laughs> they could care less about why they're there. They, they have no like motivation at all to attend to the person in the room and, and, but the instruction carries on and it's like, why? <laughs> and then we're also not talking about like, oh, they have to attend to you and look at you in your eyes either. Right. Right. No, it's just we like, it's, it's, it, we call it, um, gaze shifting. So, you know, it, it's hard to model without another person here, but it's really just yeah. like, you know, glancing and like looking to see, you know, what, what's happening over there and, and like having a genuine interest in 
because we have our interests, right? But for whatever reason, yeah. like some people are more interested in objects like you or TV, right? Like if your spouse is like watching something on TV and they're like glued to the television and you come in the room and you say something and they don't even glance over to like acknowledge that you're there, you do not have active engagement. <laughs> Yeah. Right? Like there, and then later there's going to be a big fight when it's like, Hey, I asked you to do the dishes. And they're like, what? And you, I never heard you ask me to do the dishes. And you're like, I was standing right there. You were watching golf. <laughs> well, unless you're deaf in one ear, you know, that's a perfectly good reason. I mean, there's no, times that's that... like, that's especially even more of a reason why, like they would have to get your attention first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because there's sometimes I just don't hear. Um, but no, like that's, that, that is important, like, just to even have that glance, like, so I know also for me, like, like, the idea of looking at someone in their eyes, I don't like to do that, like, for a long time, yeah. like, I do glance away, but yeah. I'm still listening to you. Yeah, yeah, it's more of, like, the check-in and in, in that kind of thing. Um, Michelle is, has joined us. Hi, Michelle, and she said she uses orienting towards speaker um, as her, one of her like phrases around that idea as well. Um, okay, I think we're good there. And then responding to your voice and words uh, for this one, this is one that I think is pretty, it's focused on a lot. Like we do a lot of receptive instruction type thing. I think again, one of the, the things that's missing though is the fun part of it. So if I'm like, um, this is one part that the ables did really well. And with, with people shifting away from using the ables, I think sometimes it doesn't get addressed, but looking at when we're looking at responding to words, someone else talking, if you have a learner where you're saying fun things, right? Like you're singing their favorite song or you're saying like, Hey, let's go find their favorite toy or Let's go um, do their favorite activity. And you say those things and they're not like up and, you know, ready to go. They're not attending to your words. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. So, and yeah. the, the ABLES, um, they had like a section on like cooperation and reinforce our effectiveness, section A, and then section C um, with receptive instructions targeted some of that. It was like follows preferred instructions you know, um, does other preferred things. I don't know. I haven't used ables for a long time, but a lot of times I think people skip that entirely. Cause it's like, we need the, the child to learn how to follow instructions, but they don't even first, uh, you know, assess whether or not the child listens to preferred things. <laughs> it's like, yeah. if they're not even listening to you and you're saying like talking about their favorite things or like doing their favorite things and incorporating language there, yeah, you know, highly unlikely they're going to listen to anything else. I have never ran an ABLES assessment, but we have had the kits and I saw them. They're massive. Yeah. But that's, that's interesting. I never got to experience that. Like that's the assessment. Yeah. So the, I think that's, that's one thing that's key to look at as well. But, um, and then the, for the last part, the communicating directly to you, we've kind of already talked about this, but Again, I think one of the, the keys with this is they talk about gestures, sounds, or words to send a message without being asked. So keep in mind, this is initiating, right? It's not just like baited opportunities or like dangling things and looking for the learner to talk. It's like, do they come up? Like when, if there is a need or, or a, a motivation of some sort, are they approaching you to communicate that? Or are they trying to figure it out completely for themselves, you know, kind of thing? Are they using you as a tool and just dragging you around and trying to like get you to do stuff? Um, are they actually recognizing like you as a communication partner and initiating that interaction, even if it's not with with vocal language, even if it's just with gestures or um, body movements of some sort, but are they initiating those things? And I, I think that we talked about this, this is typically where a lot of programs start, but even when they start here, they don't start from that initiation standpoint. They start again from those like contrived opportunities of solely looking at topography and solely trying to get, I know it sounds weird that I'm saying solely looking at topography because I'm talking about manding and we know that's a function, but it's still so topographically based because it's not yeah. looking at the true communicative intent. Like does this learner really understand like there's a communication partner here and they can initiate interactions or are they performing 
Is it more of like a circus performance? Yeah. Oh, this person's holding something back. I need to get this stuff out so I can get my thing. Yeah. Yeah. See, Joe, always have so much. I always have so much to say. Which I love. I love <laughs> this. This, this. This is why I love doing this because like I learned so much. And um, and like I said, like in this field, like you can learn so much and never be done. And I think that's important going forward. And that's just the whole reason why we have the Do Better Pod is just to learn, um, learn what we can do better as a field and how we can address some of the issues that are part of our field. Um, whether you're a behavior analyst, an RBT, a uh, clinical director, I mean, we, we have things that we can uh, do better in this field. And if you're saying that you're perfect and you have nothing to work on, then you shouldn't be in the field. <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. If you're telling me that there is nothing that you need to work on, you're, you're absolutely perfect. Um, sorry. I mean, there's always something that we can strive to do better. Yes. Yes. That's usually my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So finally, step three, working together. So they have only two for this one. Number seven is being flexible. Your child moves easily between actions, activities, or materials rather than getting stuck on certain objects or ideas. And number eight is generating new ideas. Your child comes up with creative ideas to advocate for themselves, to describe something they see, to share with you about a new and different plan or a new way to play. And I have, I have things for both of these, but do you have thoughts about either of those before I go on my <laughs> soapbox? I, I want to hear your soapbox first. Okay. So first the being flexible, again, we're all the way down at step seven. So looking at how to build active engagement, this is like the bottom part, right? Like you need to have all of these other six things first. I know, uh, uh, thankfully, a lot of people do follow children's leads and whatnot now in their sessions, but in, in a session or a classroom, how, how much of an expectation from day one, maybe day four, whatever, just think about your typical ABA session. The child moves easily between actions, activities, or materials. We come in right yeah. from the beginning with like our, all of our, these materials, all of these programs, sometimes 20, 30 different programs we're going to run, different activities we're going to do from the get without mm -hmm. putting in any effort on steps one through six. And there's just this expectation that this child is just going to go through and like transition with us and like do all these different activities with us when we haven't even assessed or analyzed, do they have these first six steps? Are they actively engaged in these first six ways to get to the point of being flexible and able to like move through different activities? This again, we're starting at the bottom instead of starting at the top. Yeah. And then, um, and they, we expect them to move through all these different programs with us, but yet for the past like year, two years, they're glued to their iPad playing Minecraft or Roblox <laughs> and we're expecting them to be flexible, like doing 20 programs when they had this glued to their, their face for their, you know, the entire year, yeah. you know? And like zero effort has been put in to like build that trusted connecting relationship or build any of those other six things that are easier around active engagement. Exactly. So again, not saying it shouldn't happen and whatnot, but especially if you're having difficulty, if you're looking at like situations where you have not, and there, there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of situations where you may first meet a child and you can go, you can start at step seven but that would generally mean the first six things are already present for that child, right? Like those are skills yeah. they already have. If you're having clients where you can just like jump in and get going, great, that's awesome. I'm not saying don't do that. Don't waste your time on stuff they already have. But yeah. what, what I am saying is make sure you're attending to assessing and analyzing. And hopefully Joe, like, um, again, I put this link in the chat and it'll be in the show notes. Like you were talking earlier about how do I train others on this? Like, this is perfect, right? Like this gives yeah. you operational definitions. It's things you can train your staff to like start doing with learners. And it's, it's a program even like, let's see, do, are these first three things here? 
nope. Okay. Then that's what we're going to be focusing on. And we're not going to be expecting much from these other areas until we have these three things, you know? Yeah. Um, so it really lays things out nicely. Then for step eight, the generating new ideas, this one's a little bit of a, a different thing. Cause I've been harping on, like we start, we're starting at the bottom, like we're starting at the harder things and we should be starting at the easier things. But this is, this is, um, it's like, let's look at how things connect. So your child comes up with creative ideas to advocate for themselves, to describe something they see, to share with you about a new and different plan or a new way to play. What often happens in initial sessions, um, and I'm I don't even mean initial sessions, initial months, years, of intervention or even like in our classrooms or the way our education system is set up do we allow space for creativity for advocating for new ideas for sharing you know their own perspectives or thoughts or are those things squashed and it's like all our agenda of like these are the activities we're here to do if you try to do something else i'm going to push you back into what we're supposed to be doing and a lot of times in the education system, it squashes all those creativity um, uh, moments. Yeah. Um, because teachers have agenda, they have a lesson plan. If you go off that lesson plan, you're in trouble. And that's where, um, that's, that's a issue in um, education. Um, in a session, that could also happen with us like having an agenda like we had to get through these programs and like hey uh this did our client may have this really fun way of doing something and we're like no we're going to do it this way yep and that's not and that's not and that's not what's beneficial for the client right yep so even if like you're working in that early part of active engagement, like even if your learner is still on those first three steps, the things we're doing during those times that um, are focused on just our agenda. And I have a training I do on this and it also ties in with like the stuff I do on escape extinction. If we're constantly doing like follow through and like focused on our own agenda and being like, you must follow these things, we're suppressing all of that like spontaneous responding and like creativity and we're punishing it. So it's mm -hmm. once they get to the point where um, more of that would be expected, it's gone. <laughs> and then everyone's like, well, why are they not spontaneous? Why don't, why don't, no, no, no. you know? And it's like, well, cause you got rid of all of that when you tried to make them follow your lead all the time, right? When you hand over hand force prompted them to, to touch their nose when they wanted to go play with the Play-Doh, um, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, and again, it, it connects together too, because remember that being flexible is part of step three, the moving easily between actions, activities, or materials. So really like in the, the earlier steps, we should be following their lead as much as possible and or and or trying to create a shared agenda where um, obviously, you know, things have to happen in the day, whether it's in the home or in the classroom, but we're supporting through, you know, whatever differences might exist there in agendas um, and not just completely squashing and like in, in that, um, allowing space for them to advocate for whatever it is. So, uh, for example, like if, um, Taylor, my son, if he wanted to, uh, say he needed to like brush his teeth, um, and you know, we're, we're going to leave for the day or whatever. And he like, didn't want to, that obviously would be an issue, right? I'm not yeah. going to force hand over hand, force him to prompt his teeth, but we're going to have a discussion about it. And I'm going to, we're going to work through it together as opposed to me just trying to come in like a hammer and be like, no, dude, this is what we're doing. And like punishing his attempts to like advocate for himself. But I would connect with him and try to find out like why he doesn't want to brush his teeth. Now he's, you know, fully vocal and he's five and that kind of thing. When he was younger, we wouldn't be able to talk about it as much, but like I, and I would have to do more work to maybe make it more fun or enticing or whatever. But there's often this like power dynamic that happens, especially when you have adults and children. And again, disabilities aside, like where it's just like, well, I'm the adult and you have to do what I say. And like it, it uh, any creativity or like self-advocacy is just like pushed down um, instead of the adult, like come like just recognizing like we're all humans. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I'm here to help like lead you through certain choices in life and whatnot. But 
Um, but I'm going to help support you and not just like push you through. Yeah. And I'm going to also be like, yeah, I know what you'd be advocating your, for yourself, but also there are some health things that, you know, it is kind of like, if you don't do this, this is a bad choice and this is why. And right. especially like brushing teeth, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a little easier. And that, I mean, there's other things too, like, for example, um, even like you were saying in play or whatever, I, I don't think you even said in play, but what came up for me when you were talking earlier, I've seen a lot of situations where a child is being creative with a toy or something. And then the adult already had a vision in their head about how that toy was going to be played with or what was going to happen, or maybe mm -hmm. a whole entire different activity was going to go down. And instead of recognizing like, oh, this kid's really interested in this right now, I'll join that and like follow that. They just keep on with whatever was in their head and they like push away the child's, like you were saying, ideas and initiations and things like that. So we've talked about what is active engagement and it only took an hour. <laughs> <laughs> But um, there's two other pieces, and this is all just on this one PDF. Um, I probably should have started with why is active engagement so important? Um, and I'm just going to read this directly because I, it can't be said any better. So this is directly quoted from the um, Autism Navigator PDF file. So it says active engagement means a child is ready to interact and learn, be productive, communicate with those around them, and hang in when faced with challenges or change. Learning how to keep your child actively engaged is important because research shows that children with autism spectrum disorder who have at least 25 hours of engaged time per week do better in kindergarten than those who do not. And that's autism specific, but again, if you do a Google search just for active engagement in general, there's tons of research and, and literature out there on just the importance of active engagement for any type of learning or, or you know um, environment, yeah. context, et cetera. Can I just say like that speaks volumes, especially whenever I observe a classroom being a behavior analyst and I see um, the classrooms that it really engage with their children, their, their students, compared to those that don't. I, have, I, I see a massive dif difference. Yep, as you should. <laughs> yeah, as I, as I should, you know? <laughs> based on the literature. Um, so then, so now that we know what active engagement is and why it's important, there's actually quite a lot of, of information on like, how do you build active engagement? So I'm just gonna finish off this PDF file. It's shorter on this end, but I have a, another resource that I'm going to share as well. So on the PDF file, it says, you're learning strategies to help you keep your child engaged so that you can achieve 25 hours of time each week helping your child interact and learn. Active engagement can occur in everyday activities that your family already spends time doing, like caregiving, having meals and snacks, playing, sharing books, and doing family chores. It can also happen in community settings, such as a grocery store, playground, or a restaurant. Your interventionist will help you see what elements of active engagement are going well and what areas need more support. Your effort to promote active engagement now will have a lasting impact on your child's social and academic success. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Autism Navigator, the resource itself is really helpful in the, this PDF file is here to give like a short thing, but there's a whole section on like active engagement with video examples and things like that. So if you're finding for yourself, listening to this podcast, that this is an area that you want to build more competency in and understanding, I would definitely recommend checking out autismnavigator.com and potentially like purchasing their trainings just to, um, to learn more about how to do it yourself, but also teach others how to do it too. So that's the, that's this one file. Um, I have a couple of other resources that I found when I was looking at this. Do you want me to, to go into those Joe, or do you have any thoughts before we move on? Um, I just think that this is super interesting and, um, it sounds like they have done a lot of work as well in active engagement. And I, I wonder like, like I said, like, I wonder why it's not in the literature, like more literature. It, I mean, it well. is, we'll, we'll talk about that. It is. Yeah. Um, it's just not like, if you're just going to look at Java, it's not there. And why, why behavior analysts haven't attended to it? I don't, this is like such a, set, yeah. we, 
Okay, make a note. We need to do a a a podcast episode on why behavior analysts do what they do. (laughs) And I'm just gonna hold it. I'm just gonna gonna hold it. A part one, part two, part three to that? I don't know. We'll have to see. But so I'm not even going to talk about it right now, why it's not in the literature. So teaser, you'll have to check out that episode when it comes out. We'll talk about that more because I could just go on. We'll we'll run out of time. Um, But there is, there is, there's, there is literature. So what I'm going to do is go to the next resource I found. So not surprisingly, um, the Marcus Autism Center has like a quick, short, little like blog type post about this. And I say not surprisingly, because a lot of the people that work with Autism Navigator, um, Florida State, they have a partnership with Marcus. So it's uh, connected there. Um, But this blog, I thought was a nice, just like short and sweet um, tips and resources on active engagement, a little bit of how it's written. I'm not a super big fan of because it talks about um, like, it's kind of places blame on the learner. It says that um, children with autism spectrum disorder often have a harder time becoming actively engaged. And it's like, well, that's not necessarily true. We're looking at neurodiversity in a neurotypical world. There, there's active engagement occurring. We have a harder time like connecting and um, having mutual active engagement, if you will. Right. Um, so they, they, anyway, so that was kind of a thing that I wasn't a huge fan of, but, um, there is a section that talks about helping your child with active engagement and I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but they give four, um, bullet points on how to, how to help build active engagement. So one is to use routines whenever possible. And then they like explain more like why that's helpful or give examples. Um, Two is help your child pay attention and participate with you. Watch to see if he is following what you're trying to do together. So that's what we, we talked about in the other um, resource as well, that active participation. Three, be aware of what your child is trying to communicate to you. Is he trying to tell or show you something he wants or is interested in? I'm going to come back to that one. And step uh, the fourth one is to help your child stay engaged through transitions. Um, so I just thought this was nice that you know, it's, it's one thing to know what act, what can make up active engagement, but then how do you ensure that you're fostering it? Right. Um, before I talk, do my little soapbox things, I'm just going to recap. So use routines, help your child pay attention and participate, be aware of what your child is trying to communicate and help your child stay engaged through transitions. Do you have any questions or thoughts about, um, those four things? I mean, like, it, it, like we go back to the whole priming thing. Like, we should prime our kids what's coming up next and what to expect for the day. Um, just changing things on them is really um, throws a lot of kids through a loop. Um, and p- helping your child pay attention and participate with you, like, I, I, I just think that's so like important and. Um, even being aware with what your child is trying to communicate to you. Like there are so many times that I have witnessed like a child trying to talk to their parents, but yet they're not paying attention. They're more worried about what's on the phone than actually what your, their child is trying to do. And then they go off and um, engage in some maladaptive behaviors and that then the parents now pay attention. So those are just some of the thoughts I have. Yes. Awesome. I know when you, when I read off those four things, it's kind of like, duh, (laughs) duh. yes, these are things, but we all get so caught up in other parts of what we're doing that these things get lost, right? Like they're not, they're, they're not a focal point. Um, and whether it's a day-to-day parenting, teaching, if you're working in a home, like just any, any type of interaction with other people, these are not necessarily priorities. Um, the one piece that I wanted to just expand on a little bit was number three, be aware of what your child is trying to communicate to you. I actually did an Instagram live on this a, a month or two ago. Um, but this is kind of, this is one of my soapboxy areas right now in that a lot of the times people are communicating things to us, 
but we're so focused on what we think communication should look like, we miss the communication that's actually happening. Um, what I've seen and have done myself and, and like wish I had not <laughs> done is we, you know, we get these communication targets in our brains, um, whether it's man training or tacting or whatever it is, like we have our things where it's like the learner must perform these things in this way. So we're so focused on getting those things to happen. We miss so much other communication that's happening around us. And that, that can definitely stifle active engagement. Imagine if you were in an environment where like, you're like constantly trying to communicate and the people don't a even acknowledge it at all. And B, keep trying to make you do different things <laughs> that you don't <laughs> understand. So like for me, the, the best analogy I can give is like going to a foreign country or something and not knowing the language at all. And maybe, you know, like the, I always give this example because it's one of my only experiences to share. But that time that I was in Egypt and Ryan and I were go trying to meet friends for dinner and we didn't have cell phones. Our driver didn't speak English. There was a really bad rainstorm and we were sitting in traffic for like two hours. And we're both just sitting there like we have no way <laughs> to like find out if they're still there, how close we are. Like it was such a stressful experience. Um, and like any of our attempts to like try to communicate with the driver, like he didn't understand and like vice versa. And that was just like two hours of my life. And it was so stressful. And then I think about like our learners and like all day long, they're doing different things to communicate with the world around them that as neurotypicals, we may not understand. And instead of trying to like recognize that and acknowledge it, and then also share with them what we, what, how we might communicate it, we're constantly just trying to push them into communicating the way we would communicate. And it's like, how frustrating would that be to like have these, you know, whether it's body movements or, um, like different gestures, which is, which are also body movements, language, looking at things, um, even sc certain scripts, you might say that like mean something to you and like all of that's happening. And not only is it not acknowledged, but you're constantly being told like, you need to do it this way instead. Right. So, yeah. um, from like an active engagement standpoint, especially like, obviously a learner is not going to stay actively engaged with you. If you're constantly not acknowledging their communication. And it's their communication, not what you want their communication to look like, <laughs> but what they're communicating to you. And by acknowledge that, I mean saying like, oh, I see you're walking towards the door. You might want to go for a walk. Like, you know, just kind of talking about like yeah. what you're observing them doing and like what you think their communication means. Or I guess yeah. what their, what their um, responding means, like what they're communicating, what they're responding. You know what's interesting is I just now thought of this. I use this with like that that little snippet, like um, being aware of what my what is being trying to be communicate uh, to me um, from my dogs, <laughs> which is interesting. Like, why aren't we doing that more as just with other human beings too? Right. Like it's like your dog gets more opportunity to communicate how it works for him than like a human. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's sad. I mean, I'm just thinking, I was like, I like I like it just dawned on me like my we we have our dog here, Blair, and she, you know, she's still a puppy and we are pay more attention to her and how she's communicating and wanting to communicate to us in her own way and like oh you're sitting by the door you must want to go outside and then we let her outside it's just like wow yeah and again we're always so focused on like what you know the goals are or whatever and it, this happens i mean I, it, I think it's obviously more of a um it's more i don't want to say issue but it, it's more apparent when there's this like d difference neurotypical versus neurodiverse it happens though in any any type of situation especially for de early development you know like a 5 year old is going to be a lot different than a 40 year old <laughs> right <laughs> um in in like what skills they have brain development all of those types of things and and it, there's just like the we all in, in 
even just adults interacting with one another, we all have our own learning histories that we're like stuck in on. So we have our expectations of this is how I would expect someone to act in this situation. And like, we get so over-focused on, are they doing that thing? And how do I make them do it that way? The way that I would do it, that we've, that we don't just sit with like observing what's happening and, and then connecting with that and interacting based off of that. I, I, that's also like thinking like, um, 10 could be an issue when dating or like marriage issues, like, like, you're not doing what I think you're supposed to be doing. Like how many fights have happened over how to properly load the dishwasher or fold clothes or whatever? <laughs> there is a certain way of doing it, Megan. There, there is. There is a certain way of folding clothes and it's not the right way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what we really mean is it's not the way like I would do it or how I would, I would expect it, it yeah. right? Like, and yeah. we don't give enough space for that flexibility of like each person just being who they are right? Yeah. Like, for, I don't know what it is about humans that we just want everyone to, to be who we are. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> mean, that would be so boring if everyone was the same, <laughs> but we, yet we that'd still try scary. to <laughs> Yeah. That would be scary if everyone was the same. Yeah. So, okay. That was, that was what I had to say about that one. And then, um, there's one other like resource. So these, I started off with just like resources and then I'll also, before we close out, talk a little bit about, we'll, we'll close out with some of the research, but this, um, I just ran, I've never heard of this before this website manual on autism. So I can't speak to the whole website, but I did read through this real quick. And I do think it's good. It's really, um, nice. They, they have, um, references and stuff, but there's also a link at the bottom that says, learn more about active engagement here. And when you click on it, it takes you, you down, it downloads a whole word file that has uh, a bit more description and example examples of ways to actively engage like with math and um, like SpongeBob, like there's different things on like a child's interest, like different resources. So this is okay. a really helpful um, website. I'm not gonna go through what it says because it's pretty much the same stuff we've already talked about, but I wanted to include it because it's a nice resource. Uh, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and can have some examples of things. That's awesome. Yeah, so they have like a, um, in their Word document, they have custom writing paper, math word problems, ideas for student choice, a reinforcement menu, so, and like a little template. So some of it's stuff that, you know, a lot of us may already have exposure to, but it might be really helpful to use with a teacher or a parent or something like that, so. Perfect. I love this. If you do a, a Google search on active engagement, like I said, a ton of stuff comes up. If you do a Google search on active engagement and autism, a ton of stuff comes up. I didn't see anything that looked fluffy or off. So those are the top three resources that I found and wanted to talk about for today's episode. But like I said, you can, there's so many resources out there uh, outside of our field. <laughs> so. And um, I'm sure that's another discussion for another day. Yeah, but I do think, I mean, we have a couple minutes left. Joe, I want you to talk about the articles you found and I'll, and then I'll tell you about the research. Okay. From my end. So I tried to use Java um, and go through different um, articles and just see what I could find. Um, so I found two articles. Um, on response to name and children with autism, treatment, generalization, and maintenance, and um, assessment and treatment of response to name for children with autism spectrum disorder towards an efficient um, intervention. Um, and basically what the, I haven't read through all that, I, I need to, um, but basically they're stating ways to, um, ways to um, assess and treat. Um, so then when you, I mean, when you say the child's name, they'll respond back to you. Um, so those are the resources I, I mean, articles that I have found um, based on just my research. 
um, I should go back and try to use, just uh, for myself use the name um, um, use the keywords for active engagement and just see what comes up. But like you said, there's probably like little to nothing. Yeah, there's probably not active. a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if you remember in those two specific articles, um, what if there was anything relating to what we talked about here with like assessing for these different um, phases, like before you try to work on a learner responding to their name, like looking to see if they're regulated. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you have like any of the, the eight things that, um, that were in our list from Autism Navigator, did they talk about like prerequisites at all or anything around that? I haven't seen anything when I looked at them, but again, like I, I would love to go back and just reread them like in depthly. It's just so to make sure that um, there might be, I mean, if they have anything, um, but yeah, those are, like I said, like those are just some of the, articles I came across that talked about um, teaching children to initiate with their uh, when responding to their name. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so Joe and I were talking about this before we started recording and, and, you know, just, I, I don't know, again, we'll save it for a whole separate episode, but for me, when I've watched presentations on like these types of skills at conferences or read articles, it, again, it just goes back into this topographical thing. Like there's some response, like responding to name that uh, people, you know, have deemed important. And instead of looking functionally at like, why do people respond to their name? <laughs> How does that come to exist in the first place? They, we just jump straight into the, um, the circus performance of like, we can teach this trick, right? Um, we mm -hmm. can teach this topographical response and there's not like the deeper dive into like understanding developmental milestones and like how these things come and like why they exist in the first place, which is just interesting to me, given how, again, how much importance we place on function <laughs> and like having functional um, programming and all of that kind of stuff. So um, when I, a lot of the like responding to name or like joint attention type things that I've seen again at conferences are all so artificial and so like laboratory based that it looks more like the kids performing a circus trick than truly engaging for the functional reasons in responses relating to like responding to their name or joint attention, like a three point gaze shift for the, sh the sheer, like um, when you do a three point gaze shift, which is joint attention, it's to share a moment with someone like, hey, I see that thing. Do you see it too? Look. You know, it's that's what it's for. That's why we like that's what joint attention is. But when I've seen a lot of behavior analysts work on it, it's the topography. It's okay, well, we need them to look at this thing, then look at me, then look back at the thing. So we'll just stimulus response consequence train that those movements, but there's no attention to like, is the learner actually doing this to share a moment with someone, or are they just like, oh, I look here, I look here, I look here, I get the MM. You know? Yeah. Um, and I've legit seen a conference presentation from a well-known researcher from a very well-established clinic in our country present excitedly on training a child exactly like I just described. And they thought that was teaching joint attention. And it's like, no, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's teaching a trick. <laughs> that's teaching a learner to look at this thing, look at you and look back at the thing just to get an m, &M. That's what you're doing. So when we get like criticisms of our field that like, you know, we're, building robots or we do things like we're training a dog or something. It's like, well, I see where that comes from sometimes, <laughs> you know, meanwhile. Yeah. So I did a Google scholar search on active engagement. And part of the reason I'm kind of confidently saying it's not going to show up in Java is when I did the, um, well, actually, hold on. I should, let me do it one more time without that. Just make sure. Yeah. Okay, so when I do the Google Scholar search, what I did is I did active engagement and I also included Weatherby um, in that search to get it more focused in on um, what I was looking for because I know she's one of the top researchers in it. Um, if you do active engagement and autism, you'll also get a bunch of things. 
but I'll post the, the links to some of these articles. But the places where this stuff is being published is like the Journal of um, Autism, let's see, and Developmental Disabilities, I think. Yeah, the, the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, Education and Treatment of Children, Intervention in School and Clinic, Teaching, um, Journal of Emotional and some things. The, some of them aren't showing up. Research in Autism Spectrum Disorders. So it's not um, Journal of Speech and Language Pathology, Journal of um, Consulting, Psychology, Pediatrics, Pediatrics. Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, topics in early childhood special education. So it's this broader, right? Like these people are publishing in big journals <laughs> focused on yeah. education and autism because that's what their expertise is in. They're not just like solo, um, they're multidisciplinary approaches, but they're behaviorally driven. Like they all align yeah. with behavior analysis. Um, so a lot of the, you know, top researchers for autism specifically, but even education, psychology, any of that kind of stuff are publishing in these bigger journals. So we just, we have to make sure that we're looking. I always use Google Scholar. I don't limit myself. Like if it's going to be in Java, it'll show up in a Google Scholar search. So I usually don't just search in like one journal. Um, but, but that's part of the issue, like in our graduate programs and things like that, we're not necessarily trained. To, to like read and consume literature outside of the few behavior analytic journals that we have. Yeah. And there's such great literature out there. Um, but anyway, so there's, um, just to tell you about a couple of them from the results, if you look, if you restrict it to Weatherby, they have several studies they did using um, the CERTS model. So social communication, emotional regulation and transactional support. So looking at how to build active engagement in the classroom. And then they mm -hmm. also have quite a few studies around the research they've been doing on the early social interaction projects where they're training parents. Um, so there's, um, there's at least six or seven different studies and each one talks a little bit about active engagement. One of the ones I liked the mo that I like the most is um, from the speech and language. Um, it's a uh, full, you can, uh, access the full, I'm going to post it in the comments, but you can access the full article. It's open source and it's called changing the developmental trajectory. Where did it go? Sorry. I lost it. And while you're talking about that, I did do a search on Java and there's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> um, so this is called Changing Developmental Trajectories of Toddlers with Autism Spectrum Disorder, Strategies for Bridging Research to Community Practice. So this, the point of this article is not about active engagement, but they have a whole section towards the end of the article where they talk about um, their, like re the results. And one of their, one of the things that they like uh, measured specifically is new, it says new findings on child active engagement from the early social interaction um, randomized control trial. So they go into like detail here about um, active engagement, like what it is, but they've developed a measure of active engagement. It's abbreviated MAE. And there's a study from Weatherby, Morgan and Holland in 2013 that um, explains in more detail what the measure of active engagement is. The reason I wanted to share this article specifically is for those of you who might be listening to this episode thinking about like, wow, active engagement sounds really important, but how do I measure that, right? <laughs> so there's a whole entire um, like line of research on this basically. And like I said, Dr. Weatherby, Dr. Lindy Morgan, um, Christine Holland, they're the three, um, I think it's Christine, they're the three, like some of the leading researchers. And I had the, the wonderful opportunity to like work with each of them, not work directly, but like learn from them when I was doing some of the stuff at Florida State. So that's how I'm familiar with it. But that, that's where I would be like looking at your research is like read every single one of Weatherby and Morgan's articles on this. Um, but what they found with their early social interaction project is that um, when they did they they had a baseline measure of active engagement and the um, whether the uh, they had two different groups, individual and group. So the parents could get one on one early social interaction or group 
early social interaction and they were looking to see if there was a difference in active engagement. Um, for baseline, I don't, the composite score was pretty low for both like 11 and 13, 11 for individual and 13 for group. At the end of nine months of the early social interaction, the individual was at 19, which the highest is 20. Um, and the group was at 17. So there was a huge increase and it is progressive. Like every few months they're like gaining um, in their active engagement. And to me, these are the things we need to be measuring. Like seeing that a parent can actively engage with their child is so much better than seeing that they ma they mastered 50 items on the VB map. Like these are, these are the like broader framework things where like, if I can teach someone how to be actively engaged, whether it's a parent, an RBT, a teacher, whoever, that's going to have lifelong impacts because they're going to be able to carry over all of those skills to like any learning opportunity, as opposed to, again, focusing on like, can we check off this like 10 or 15 different things from like the VB map? So um, anyway, so the, I would highly recommend reading this article and like the relating research and I'll put each of the articles that I, I'm not going to put all of them, but I'll put like the top couple in the show notes. Perfect. I think our listeners will come love that. And hopefully they also will take the time to go through this. I know I will um, and put this away in my file because like, I, I feel like this is something that's important to talk about. Um, and like for me, like I, I, I want this to be an area of growth for me too. Yes, it's an area of growth. Again, for I think for society in general, like I watch how people engage with Taylor and I'm just like, why? <laughs> why can you not have more active engagement, right? Like just parent, like especially just broader parenting, like anyone, I keep saying parenting and talking about children, but it's really like get, understanding the research that's been done in this area broadly should help society. <laughs> like if we could all <laughs> just engage better with each other and like have these more actively engaged opportunities with one, one another and be more connected, we would see so many different outcomes in education, in business productivity, and how humans treat one another. <laughs> like it's, just, <laughs> it's so broad. <laughs> so Joe, when um, when you contacted, when we connected earlier this week about what to talk about, did you think we were gonna go into like this much detail around this? <laughs> no, I thought it would be a quick, you know, like 30 minute, an hour, you know, podcast and like, no. Um, obviously like, we could keep on going on in more in depth about active engagement. Um, but no, I love that. Um, I did not, I totally did not realize like the depths that you can go into with this topic, which I love. I mean, I love talking about this stuff that, you know, might not just be in your coursework. Like this is the stuff that, you know, coming out of uh, your coursework and passing the board, this is stuff that we need to like newer BCBAs need to um or green BCBAs need to go in depth with and even like BCBAs that have been in the field for a while like this is stuff that is nice to be refreshed on or even learn more about yep exactly and it's ever evolving to um you know obviously like we've talked about we can always do better so this yeah. is what the research says now. And I'm sure there will be, especially like when you think about how many advancements are made and like technology and how much competition there is, like you mentioned earlier with like the iPad and things like that, like getting the active engagement. Um, if there's more telehealth or remote kind of services, schooling being provided, like how do you get active engagement in those environments, yeah. <laughs> you know, all of that kind I mean, of stuff. It, I mean, just the idea that in the future we're going to have more um, more things that's going to grab our attention and just come to uh, contend with. Like I can imagine like even like if we walk into a grocery store or um, a shopping mall or there's going to be ads that are going to focus on you and really um, try to 
gain your attention. Like it, it like they're uh, like just pull you away from actually like being present in society too. Yep. And so, the, of course, like there's the whole like we're all getting shorter attention spans and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. So like maintaining the duration, like that um having longer periods of active engagement when we're used yeah. to just like <laughs> constantly all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, just imagine like how much ad, like just ha- just imagine all the stimuli that can uh, occur in our environment. I mean, our environments like here in 20 years. I know. Uh, compared to where we were back in the 80s where it, it was not that much. Now, there's so much. Yep, there's for so much sure. <laughs> well, I'm glad we finally got to um, record again. And thanks for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Um, sorry, we didn't really pause a ton for active participation ourselves. <laughs> We're not being yeah. a very good model of active engagement today. Um, but we needed to make sure we got through this before I pass out. And Joe has other things to do today. Um, for the future episodes we have some good ideas but if anyone has a topic they want us to talk about feel free to let us know and we will be on live again for our wheel decide wednesday every wednesday we should be back on track for that now too so awesome yes so stay tuned and you know we'll let you know when our next uh podcast live maybe maybe (laughs) <laughs> Maybe you just need to be on your, uh, have that like a notification set for whenever we um, post something or whenever we are starting a live event that that rings and that's your prompt to get on Facebook. <laughs> there you go. All right, everyone go forth and do better. Bye guys. <laughs>